lots of different theologies and philosophies and thoughts. And we've looked at this is actually a, the 15th teaching in this, believe it or not. So, yeah, well, only the 15th. We're coming to the last one next week. But we discovered that in, in some faiths, there's 333 million gods. How confusing would that be? We've looked at lots of different things. And so the Apostles' Creed is a gathering together as a summation of the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. And, and so there's a lot of emphasis on quite deep subjects about the, the birth, the incarnation, and the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and all these different teachings that we looked at. And, and so we've been trying to present them in a way that help us to understand them as lay people, because we're not theologians, most of us, but we need to know what we believe. Because the Bible says, James said, you're, you're tossed to and fro. He spoke to some young believers. He said, you'll be tossed to and fro if you don't understand that there are lots of doctrines out there. There's lots of winds of doctrine that will take you all sorts of directions, and you'll be double-minded in your ways. And, and so we need to know what we believe. And uh, so it's maybe been more of a teaching season rather than an inspirational season, but I think that's so important for many of us here, young Christians, new Christians, to know what we believe. And so this is coming to the very end with two other pages like this, and this is coming to the end. Today we're going to talk about the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And then next week we're going to talk about what, what does amen mean? We just think amen is something at the end of a, a prayer, but amen means so much more. Amen. And, and so today we're going to look at the resurrection of the body and uh, these couple of themes that come through. So this, these were key themes of Jesus, uh, and we'll see why as we go through this. So a key theme of Jesus' teaching was the resurrection and life after death. I was just reading an article on Google, uh, and it was saying that they did a survey a number of years ago, and, and maybe two or 3,000 people this spoke to. So this is not conclusive, but they asked how many pe people believed in life after death, and about half of them did which I would, now this took place in the UK, so I was quite surprised. I thought, wow, that's higher than I thought it would have been. But that means half of the people also believe there's no life after death, and they believe, as Monty Python would have said, you're put in the ground and your body's eaten by maggots and weevils, nibble, nibble, nibble. And so if you don't know who Monty Python is, that will not mean anything to you. <laughs> but Jesus and the apostles talked a lot because when you imagine we're looking back 2,000 years later, we know all the stories. We know about the cross. We know about the crucifixion. We have been maybe brought up in Sunday school. Maybe we haven't, but we have an idea. We know there was crosses and there's crucifixes, and we know about Jesus a little bit, some people more than others. But this was the initiation of, of the Christian faith. And so in the early days, we see Jesus prophesying what's going to happen to him, and then we see the apostles talking a lot about the resurrection because it's a key, probably is the key to our whole Christian faith. And so Jesus talks a little bit about it. We see in John, he says, in the end, on the last day, because there's a day coming, as we're going to see in a moment or two, there's a trumpet is going to blow. Do, 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 do. I think it'll be louder than that and more scary than that. But the, <laughs> I'm probably in tune. <laughs> Andy, that's your fault for praying last week. Anyway. In the end, in the last day, he wants everything to be resurrected into new life. So if you want to know the will, the will of the Father, know this. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him as Savior will live eternally. Isn't that good news, isn't it? Will live eternally. And on the last day, I am the one who will resurrect him. So Jesus is the one who's going to resurrect our bodies. Because the rest of us, is, we will live eternally, but our bodies, if, if we die before the Lord returns, our bodies are going to be dead, but the Jesus is telling us our bodies are going to be resurrected. Now, they're not going to be the same as they are at the moment, you'll be glad to hear, but we'll, that's what we're going to discover this morning. Everybody's body will be resurrected. You know, for a long time as a new believer, I thought, well, it's just the Christian's bodies are going to be resurrected. But everybody's body is going to be resurrected. Everybody throughout the ages of history, his body will be resurrected. Look what Jesus said. The time is coming when every dead and buried, when everyone dead and buried will hear his voice. Those who have lived the right way or given their lives to Jesus will walk out into resurrection life those who have lived the wrong way into a resurrection judgment. 
So everyone, everyone who's ever born is going to born and died. When Jesus returns, their body is going to be resurrected. Now, not everybody believed this. This austere group of men uh, are the Sadducees. And you can, as you can see, they're very sad. Uh, and so they didn't believe in the resurrection. It's quite interesting. These people believed in very little, but we'll, we'll look at that later on. But they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so as we can see in Mark, these guys were always coming up, goading Jesus and trying to trick him, asking him trick questions. And this is one of the cases. It says, then Jesus was approached by some of the Sadducees. Now, if you've been in church for many years, you will know the joke is, well, uh, why were they called the Sadducees? Because they were Sadducees. That's sad, isn't it? Uh, and so, but they were sad in a sense because they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so it says, then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. And so they came and they asked Jesus, well, according to Moses, if you... Uh, were married and you died and you didn't have any children. Your brother had to marry your wife uh, to give you an heir. And then they tell this big convoluted story. This guy had seven brothers and they all died and they all married somebody else. And whose wife are they going to be in the resurrection? Now, they were just tricksters and gangsters because they didn't believe in the resurrection anyway. And, and Jesus answered them and, and all the rest of it. And, and so their, their trick questions were very quickly turned back on, on themselves. But we also see the early church having to contend with this lack of belief in the resurrection and everlasting life. Uh, and it was part of the culture, uh, because of we've been, we, been brought up in a so-called Christian culture and country, although we're post-Christian really. But in these days, there were many, many different philosophies and theologies and doctrines, as there is now, but they were strong because this Christian faith was a new faith in a sense. And so they had a lot of persuading. Uh, in those days, you could have went up the street and you would enter the marketplace. You went to the temple and they had all these different porches, uh, not porches, porches, and different areas where people could debate. And they told, well, I believe that God is so and so and I believe this philosophy and I believe this theology. And so you could, it was the dumb thing to do to debate in the open air. Not so good in Northern Ireland because it's usually pouring with rain. But they seem to enjoy a good debate, and the Apostle Paul seemed to enjoy a good debate. And we see the Apostle Paul in Acts. He was having this debate, having this uh, conversation. And it says, some of the Epicurean, now these were, these were philosophers, these were the people of the day that think, you know, we've got it right, we've got all the truth. Here's what they believed, who believed the goal of life was pleasure. Some of their family's still around, aren't they? You go out on a Friday night or a Saturday night or any night and you go around the bars and nightclubs, most people believe life's all about pleasure. They're not thinking about death. They're not thinking about sin. They're not thinking about anybody else. Give me a good time. I call it binge enjoyment. People work all week so they can go out and get blocked on a Friday night or Saturday night. They, they work. They don't enjoy their work. They don't enjoy... Monday to Friday, terribly, there's more suicides on a Monday morning than any other time of the week. Uh, they don't really enjoy what they're doing, but as long as I can get out on a Friday night and get blocked, then I'm happy enough. That was these people's theology in a nutshell. They pleasure, who they believed the goal of life was pleasure, but they didn't believe the soul survived, de uh, the soul survived death. So once you died, you died. That was their philosophy. They were hedonistic, we would use the term. They were life short, enjoy it while you can, because once it's over, it's over. So Paul is trying to debate with these people. Then there was another group. They were Stoic philosophers. We, we still use that word today, that you say somebody who's a bit sort of, well, life, whatever. Uh, they're Stoic. They have a Stoic personality. So the Stoics, they believed that life should be lived with indifference, to pleasure and pain. So if something good happens, you ever meet those sort of people, you may be one of them, and say, you've just won a million pounds, great. <laughs> you've just lost a million pounds, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 
Are you, don't, don't put your hand up. If you're one of those people, but there are people like that in life, stoic, they're stoic. So th these people, the generations have come behind and they believe that life should be lived with indifference to pleasure and pain and did not believe the soul was immortal either. So they didn't, they believed when you died it was all over as well. It's called secular humanism in today's society. And they might not be called Stoics, they may not be called Epicureans, but many, many people, that's their philosophy of, of life. Either binge enjoyment, just enjoy life. It's, there's a great program on how millionaires holiday. Do you ever see that holiday? It's, what's it called? Millionaires Holiday Club. And some of these people are spending like one couple that show they're just spending their life in these big cruises at 50 grand a week uh, and so they just are relatives of some of these of these epicureans and people live their lives at different levels of that and no thought for tomorrow no thought for eternity when life's over may as well make the best of it and so paul's having this great discussion so he ar they argued with paul and saying what is this babbler this charlatan and this ignorant show-off trying to say so they had a, not a particularly interesting, well, they had an interesting view of Paul, but they weren't particularly impressed with Paul. They said, he's babbling, he's just waffling on. He's, he's a trickster, he's a charlatan, charlatan. He's ignorant of the knowledge that we have of life. What's he trying to say? Others said he seems to be telling us about some foreign gods, strange deities. But here's what Paul was telling them. When Paul was telling them about Jesus and his rising from the dead, the resurrection, so the resurrection stirred this great emotion, stirred this great debate. So when Jesus brought it, that he had opposition from the Sadducees and from other people, he was foretelling of his resurrection. See, what's the difference between resurrection and being raised from the dead? You see, people have been raised from the dead. We see, remember in the Old Testament, the guy was thrown into the prophet's uh, grave and the, and the anointing was so strong, he came back to life. Lazarus had been raised from the dead, but these people all died again resurrection has a whole different terminology when we study it in the scriptures as we are going to see in a minute so the, there's a difference between being raised from the dead people have been raised from the dead but then they die again at some stage resurrection is to do with everlasting life and that's why those two little summaries go together in the apostles creed so paul was telling them about the resurrection you see we also live in a secular and religious world today where many do not believe and life after death or the resurrection of the body. If you work in, in different environments, you go to school in different environments, people, most people you talk to, they would laugh you to scorn, just as, as, as Paul found, as we go on to see here in Acts 17, said when the people heard about Jesus being raised, the resurrection from the dead, some of them laughed, mocked, and scoffed. You ever try to share your testimony in work? You ever try to share your testimony? Ever been laughed at? Ever been mocked? You Christians, Christianity is nothing but a crutch. Well, actually, Christianity is more like a stretcher <laughs> because God carries us through. And, and so uh, sometimes we try to share our faith. Sometimes we try to talk about eternity. Sometimes we try to talk about the resurrection and life after death. And some people laughed, laugh and mock and scoff us. But... Others said, we will hear more about this from you later. This is interesting. Have you ever been in a group? See, when crowds get together, there's always somebody starts it, isn't there? And then they all mock and scoff you. There's always one or two people who really want to hear what you have to say, but they haven't the guts to say, well, hold on. I want to hear what this person has to say because the crowd dominates. The loudness, the noise of the crowd dominates. But it says, but others said, we will hear more about this from you later. And I'm sure many of us can think of times when maybe in a crowd, maybe the conversation has come up about Christianity, about our faith or our testimony. And some people, I don't believe in all that. Mm, God's this and Christians are that and blah, blah, blah. But there'll be individuals or one or two within that group. You can see they're not as vociferous. They're not as loud. They're actually listening because they're thinking, I actually want to talk to you later about this. We need to have our antennae up, being aware, because sometimes we take it personally, don't we? Sometimes when somebody told you the story before about uh, a lady who got saved in the church and then she went to visit her, her family 
overseas and she was telling them about her faith and then said, anybody who's a Christian is just weak and whatever. So she told them if they didn't believe in Jesus, they were effing stupid. And then she came home and repented to me. <laughs> and, and she, but she said the word. And, and uh, I said, well, technically speaking, you're right. <laughs> but there's probably a better way you could have said it. And I said, we need, you need to learn as a new Christian, don't take it personally. It's not you to have the problem with. It's your Savior. It's Jesus. And so Paul understood this, that in the crowd, so please don't use that terminology if, you're, if someone is rebuffing your testimony, your Christian faith. But be watching out for those people in the conversation who think, well, there's somebody really latching on to what I'm saying because the Holy Spirit may be moving in that person's life because they will be the people we'll ho hear more about this from you later. And so you're going to get opportunity maybe to talk to people about faith and, and the things of God. So Paul realized he was in another situation having another debate. He was on his way to Rome to go to trial. And in the midst of all this debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it says, Paul, I love Paul. Paul loves a good argument. Paul reminds me of my mother. My mother could start a fight in an empty room. She could argue with you, and then she could argue the opposite. And, and uh, maybe that's where I get it from. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's Paul. I, just, I, I smile at Paul. I and mean, maybe you don't see this as you read the Bible. That When I read the Bible, I just think, wow, what a great man. Paul realized that some members of the high council were Sadducees. And some were Pharisees. Now, Paul remembers a Pharisee himself. He was a Pharisee. So he shouted, brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my uh, ancestors. In fact, one of the translations says, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. My father and my grandfather, those all before me were Pharisees. And I'm on trial here because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. Now, Sadducees are really aggravated at this because they remember they don't believe that there's a resurrection from the the dead. Now the Pharisees are happy days. We believe, yes, we believe there's a resurrection from the dead. But they, be, they only believe there's a resurrection of the dead for those who love God. They actually don't believe there's a resurrection of the dead for the wicked. So it's very interesting. So here they are. So the Sadducees are over here. They're, they're grumbling and moaning and complaining. Pharisees are over here saying, oh, this, well, maybe, maybe we misjudge this. Paul fellow, he's not a bad creator after all. You know, yeah. you know the way you, you tend to go with the people that are agreeing with you? <laughs> Sometimes we shouldn't do that. Sometimes that will take us down a dead end street. I am on trial here because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This divided the council, the Pharisees against the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection. But they also don't believe in angels or evil spirits also. I was thinking about this. Imagine if you're going to start a sect. Imagine you're going to start a group. You usually start it because you believe in something. Well, I'm in the Manchester United Supporters Club. So what do you believe? Well, I don't like the manager. I don't believe in the manager. I don't believe we've got a good team. I don't believe we're going to win anything this year. I don't really believe Sir Alex Ferguson won all those trophies. No, you, if you're a part of something, you're in it because you believe in it. You're in it to win it. Isn't that right? So here's guys, start at the Sadducee group. Well, we don't believe in the resurrection. We, we don't believe in angels. We don't believe in evil spirits. We don't believe in the supernatural. Well, what the so-and-so do you believe? Well, we, ju we don't believe in those things. So here they are. But the Pharisees believe in all these things. So ex with the exception of the dead being raised. So look what Paul goes on to say. I have the same hope in God that they have the hope that all people, good and bad, righteous and unrighteous, will surely be raised from the dead, resurrected, the righteous to salvation, the wicked for judgment. So now Paul has aggravated everybody. So he has aggravated the Sadducees. He's aggravated the Pharisees. But what has he done? He's brought truth. Because the Sadducees were in error. The Pharisees were in error. And so he brings truth into the situation. And so, but you can't bring truth into a situation if you don't know what the truth is. And this is why we've been studying 
the Apostles' Creed because we want to know what are our foundations, what is the foundations of our faith. Because otherwise, when people come to talk to us about secular humanism or Islam or whatever it happens to be, Jehovah's Witnesses or anybody raps on your door and says, well, I want to come in and tell you about Jesus. We, we need to know what we believe, otherwise we'll be totally confused. And so this is why we've been spending this time on a Sunday morning going into these things in depth. And so Paul didn't compromise truth because he, if you, we would be saying, well, the Sadducees are against me, but at least I have the Pharisees on side. So he thought, well, they're, they're they haven't got truth here. So he wasn't trying to bring, make people like him with his, by diluting his argument. He kept on the lines of the truth. So we're all in big trouble if there's no resurrection. Isn't that right? Because then the Epicureans are right. Then the Stoics are right. Then the secular humanists are right. And life's over. When it's over, it's over. Paul says this actually in 1 Corinthians. He said, now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. You ever had one of those conversations with yourself? Anybody ever ask you something that was profound yet troubling? We should be asking ourselves these sort of questions, you know. We sh as Christians, we should have conversations with other people and with ourselves that are profound and yet troubling. Because otherwise we're never going to change. We need to know what we believe and we need to get rid of stuff that's, that's not right in what we believe. Now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say there's no such a thing as a resurrection? If there's no resurrection, there's no living Christ. Isn't that right? What are we doing here? We might as well be sitting at home on a Sunday morning. If there's no resurrection, there is no risen Savior. There's no risen Christ. That's the whole emphasis. That's the whole foundation of our faith. And face it, and, and face it if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. Everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits or proofs that we've passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, Sheer fabrications if there's no resurrection. Now, we don't go around to believe every day of the week thinking about the resurrection, but we should be thinking more about it than we do. We should be thinking about life after death because it will actually direct us in our day. There are things that we will not do in life if we think about the resurrection of Jesus and think about the afterlife. There are things we will do if we think about them, because we will think, hold on, I have so many years here. I have a purpose. I have a destiny. I have an assignment in God. I can't be footering about over here doing stuff that's going to be taking me away from it. I need to be getting on with what God has called me to do and being an outflow of what he has called me to be. Isn't that right? Uh, otherwise, we just can look back in our lives and think, wow, I just wasted. You ever feel you've wasted time in a day? Don't put your hand up. But you don't want to get to the end of your life and think, what a waste of a life. So these things challenge us. These things focus us. So Paul explains the dynamics of how the resurrection is going to work. Because we love to know sciencey stuff, don't we? I don't know if you'd call it sciencey stuff. But we love to, well, how's that going to work? And what's it going to be like? And the Bible doesn't give us all the answers. But Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians 15. If you have time this week, and even you haven't time, make time. Go home and read 1 Corinthians 15. And, and, and read it maybe in an older translation, but then in a newer translation. It's amazing. Just it gives us a great explanation of, of what this whole resurrection uh, of the dead is going to be like and our new bodies, etc. So it is with the resurrection of the, the dead, the body. So remember, if we die before the Lord returns, we're still living, but our body's dead. That makes sense? Our body is in the ground or cremated or whatever we've done, but our soul, our spirit, we're, we're still, our consciousness is living on, our soul is living on. And so the great truth about the resurrection is we're going to be reconnected with a body that we can do stuff in eternity, not just floating about like Ghostbusters. I see the new Ghostbusters movie out. But anyway, <laughs> that's not an advertise. There are other movies. <laughs> not getting paid by the Ghostbusters franchise. It's okay. 
So it is with the resurrection of the dead, the body that is sown is perishable. Do you know your body, you have a perishing body? <laughs> your body is perishing. And some, do you ever, anybody not have any aches or pains or creaks or think, oh, I may maybe need more cod liver oil. <laughs> and the older you get, sometimes you think, well, yeah, I st we still feel 20 inside, but we look in the mirror and realize we're nearly 60. And, and so are whatever, 50, 40, whatever age we are. So we have a perishing body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishing. There's a perishing body and it decays. But the body that is resurrected is imperishable. It's immune to decay. It's immortal. When you think of all these superhero movies, you think of Superman and the X-Men, every movie of that genre, what is it trying to do? It's trying to create a vision of immortality, isn't it? And yet, that's what God created us, to be immortal. We are immortal. When we give our lives to Jesus, when I were immortal, we we're going to live forever. But we are, if we trust in Jesus, we're going to have immortality just like Jesus had with his resurrected body. This is amazing stuff. So let's see what the scriptures go on to say. Uh, this is a big passage. I've just picked little bits and pieces out of it. So here's this body that we have. It is sown a natural body. So my body's a natural body. Your body hit yourself somewhere. Your body's a natural body, isn't it? So it's sown. When we die, our body is sown a natural body. Mortal, suited to this earth. Well, our body is suited to this earth, isn't it? In fact, in this passage, it goes on to say there's lots of different types of body. There's fruit. There's vegetables. There's fish. There's birds. There's sun, there's stars, there's the moon. These are there's terrestrial bodies, there's celestial bodies, there's natural bodies. God has created all these different types of bodies, which are incredible, and they suit the environment they're in. We don't suit the sun, we're built for earth. Our mortal bodies are built for earth. And so this body, when it dies, it's a natural body, it's mortal, it's suited to the earth. But it's raised a spiritual body. Immortal suited to heaven. Now we see with Jesus, Jesus had a natural body. When he was born, he was born of Mary. He was a man. He was fully man, the Bible tells us. He had a natural body. But when he was resurrected, he had a spiritual body. And he said, don't, he said, in the early days, he said, don't touch me. He said, I'm flesh and bone. Which would tell me there was no blood in, in, our, in our new bodies. Because we, we would say there's flesh and blood. And so the new body can be flesh and bo bone because it's empowered by the Spirit of God, not by the blood. And, and so Jesus' blood was shed for us, uh, for our sins. So it's, this, is a, this spiritual body is going to look like us, possibly, in our prime. I don't know. Jesus died when he was around 33. But Mary recognized him, didn't she? So he didn't look different. She still recognized him, but he had a totally different body. And yet he was, that body was able to eat because he ate with them, but it was able to appear and disappear. He turned up with the disciples in a room that had a locked door. So the Bible doesn't tell us an awful lot about our new bodies, but it said it's no longer a natural body. It becomes a spiritual body that's suited for heaven. Now, I'm not making this up. This is the scriptures. You can go and read it for yourself. But sometimes we don't study this stuff. As surely as there is a physical body, there is a spiritual body. As it is written in Scripture, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, an individual. The last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, restoring the dead to life. So in eternity, so I don't think we're going to look like this. That's just to make sure you're not sleeping. That's gross. <laughs> so this is not my image of what we're going to look like in heaven. That's just to make sure you aren't sleeping. You can go on to the next one. <laughs> I don't know what our bodies are going to look like, whether they'll be ripped or whether they'll be tanned or what they'll be like. But they'll, people will be recognizable as who we are, but we will, we will have spiritual bodies. I, I, I'm, I can't, well, I can't wait. <laughs> I can wait till I die. I don't want this. I'm not saying, Lord, take me home now because I want to find out how this works. But, uh, but it's going to be amazing, isn't it? These are immortal bodies that are never going to die again. It's worth being a Christian, isn't it? It's worth a bit of scoffing. It's worth a wee bit of somebody making fun of you. It's worth somebody, well, I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, whatever. Please yourself. 
not my problem. That's maybe not very loving. I need a bit more of the fruit of the spirit there. <laughs> but this is a mortal body suit up for earth. <laughs> That's my excuse. Listen very carefully. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep in death, but we will be completely changed. Wondrously transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet. Do, 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 do. That's just to annoy Andy. <laughs> For a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believe in Christ will be raised imperishable. So your perishing body is going to be imperishable. Isn't that amazing? We will be completely changed, wondrously transformed, for this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature, and this mortal part of us that is capable of dying must put on immortality. Isn't that great news if you have an illness or you're troubled with sickness through life or you have been one of those people that just your body, your earthly body hasn't been great? It hasn't served you maybe as well as you liked to have been. One day you're going to have an imperishable body. One day you're going to have a perfect body. One day you're going to have this immortal spiritual body that's fitted for heaven. That gives us hope, doesn't it? That gives us encouragement. A little slide that says, so in these scriptures we looked at, the perishable is going to become imperishable. The, one of the scriptures says it's sown in dishonor. It's going to be raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's going to be raised in power. It's a natural body. It's going to become a spiritual body. So just to summarize, life does not end when we die. Doesn't matter what the secular humanists tell us. Doesn't matter what the Stoics tell us. Doesn't matter what the Epic Epicureans tell us. We're Christians. We believe what the Bible tells us. We believe what Jesus tells us. We believe what the, those men and women of God that he raised up with the truth tell us. Life does not end when we die. The resurrection brings with it an immortal body that is prepared for eternity with Jesus. Or prepared for an eternity in Gehenna, as the Bible calls it, or hell. I, I don't want to go there. I don't know about you. I don't know all the details of it. All I know is I want to be with Jesus. I want to be in heaven. I want to have an, an imperishable, immortal, spiritual body that's fitted for eternity. You would be daft not to want that. For the sake of being an Epicurean and thinking, well, life's all about pleasure. I think I could go for, forego a little bit of pleasure to serve God and to love God and to be on his side. Revelation says this, and the sea delivered up the dead who were in it, death and Hades, the state of death or disembodied existence surrendered the dead in them and all that were tried and their cases de and their cases and all were tried and their cases determined by what they had done according to their motives aims and works so the seas wherever everything's going to give up all those who have died in history and, and they're going to have to stand before God then those unbelieving people will go away into eternal everlasting unending punishment but those who are righteous and in right standing with God will go by his remarkable grace into eternal, everlasting, unending life. You know, our righteousness, those who are righteous and those who are in right standing with God, it's not because of anything we have done. It's because of everything of what Jesus has done. It's all about his death, it's about his resurrection, it's about the shedding of his blood for our sins and our responding to that. And, and so... Sometimes we think, oh, well, we, we, we feel guilty when we call ourselves righteous. No, well, we're not righteous in ourselves. It's imputed righteousness, the Bible tells us. It's his righteousness that he has, has given me. Uh, when I was a little boy, there was a program on, on a Saturday morning called Multicolor Swap Shop. Anybody old enough to remember that? There's all the over 50s. And so you swap stuff. It was multicolored swap shop. You swap stuff. So you swap something bad for something good or something you didn't like for something you wanted. Well, God did that for us. He swapped our sin for Jesus' righteousness. Isn't that amazing? The Bible tells us when he looks at us as Christians, he sees Jesus. He sees the blood. He sees us as righteous. Not because we always get it right, because, but because of what Jesus did. Uh, and so... What a, what a swap shop. Last slide. 
just reiterating that remarkable grace. But those of us who are righteous and in right standing with God will go by his remarkable grace. Not just any old grace, it's remarkable grace into eternal, everlasting, unending life. Maybe the band would just join me uh, on the platform. You know, this is why we have the...